Hi, thank you so much. I'm excited to be able to talk to all of you today. Um, what I want to focus on is the program that we offer at the University of Redlands, along with some of the work that I do specifically, which focuses on marine mammals. And for those of you who don't know where Redlands is, not too far from Dana Point, actually, um, just basically head uh, northeast a little bit, but just past um, Riverside, and you'll come across our beautiful campus in Redlands. So a lot of times people want to think about, you know, how do you get going in this field? And everybody has their own path. So I just want to briefly share my background. And I really have to give a lot of the credit to my dad, who inadvertently led me down this pathway. Uh, he was not the best student himself, um, very smart, but didn't do so well academically. And when he graduated from high school, his big dilemma was whether he should become a surf bum or a ski bum. He chose surf because he could do it year round and he moved from California to Hawaii. He then decided he should go back to school, got his engineering degree, met my mom, they got married, but they went back to Hawaii um, and that's where I was born. So. I grew up at the ocean, fortunately. Um, I lived in Hawaii and then California. We spent a lot of time traveling to the local islands. I started scuba diving pretty young and I developed a passion for marine biology, specifically marine mammals. I was that kid who decided this is what I wanted to do at a really young age. And so when it was time to go to college, I looked for programs that had marine biology. And of course, came across UC Santa Cruz and fortunately was able to volunteer in their marine lab working with um, pinnipeds, so like this harbor seal. And from there, I went on to graduate school. I did my master's in British Columbia, Canada, studying stellar sea lions, and then came back to California to UCLA for my PhD, studying gray whale foraging ecology. Uh, and from there, ended up going to upstate New York for six years, for my first faculty position. So I've moved around a lot with different opportunities to study different species. And fortunately, it's something that I feel very passionate about. So I've been able to develop projects that I'm really excited about and get to enjoy. Uh, now I am married. My husband is a wildlife photographer and ceramic artist and professor. So fortunately, we like to do a lot of the same things. Uh, we have a daughter, that's her when she was much younger, but that was one of my favorite pictures when I, you know, trying to raise her to be a bit of a marine person as well. We travel a lot together to do research and to lead travel classes. Um, uh, and that's actually one of the things I wanted to talk about going into the program at University of Redlands. Oops, sorry. By the way, please feel free to ask questions um, and as we go. And of course, I'll make sure we have time at the end as well. So I mentioned when I was looking for programs, I wanted one with a marine biology degree. And what I didn't realize at the time was that a lot of time, in most cases, students specialize either after or through additional opportunities. So at the University of Redlands, although we don't have a degree in marine biology, we have a lots of pathways for students. And many of my students do go on into careers in this field. And I'll talk more about them in a little bit. So typically, if students are interested in this, they can do a major in biology, chemistry, physics, environmental studies, or science. We also have a new major called human animal studies, which was a minor, but has become a major option. And that allows students to really kind of design um, what their focus is in terms of that field, but something focused on the relationship between obviously humans and other animals. We also have a Johnston Center for Integrative Studies where students are able to develop their own major to really emphasize what they're especially interested in and they work with faculty to select the coursework. I always encourage students to study abroad, especially those who think they want to go into the marine sciences field so that they can get experience in another location. So we have semester programs. Uh, a lot of our students who like 
who want to go onto this pathway study abroad in places like Turks and Caicos or do sea semester or go to Australia um, or Tanzania. So there's a lot of different options and the university makes it really easy for students to spend a semester abroad and have all their coursework come back and count for their, you know, for their degree here. We also have something that I really love, um, and that is our May term, which is one month, obviously in May, where students take a single class. And if they choose, they can go on a travel course. So I really enjoy teaching these. I've done some that were kind of a mix between living on campus and doing travel locally within California. Uh, I've done ones where we travel for the whole month. I've, taught one to the Pacific Northwest, typically from Washington through Alaska. That one we've done a few different times. We've done ones to the Galapagos. Um, and the one that I teach most frequently is in Palau. A lot of people don't know where that is. It's a small island nation in Micro Micronesia, not too far from Guam. And it's one of the few places that has protected its waters for to try, try and conserve the ocean resources and prevent you know, overfishing and other problems. And so we focus on marine sustainability and do a lot of different experiences, including scuba diving for those who are certified. Another great opportunity we have is for summer research. So we have our internal program that's funded by an endowment, which means that students get paid to work full time for 40 hours a week over 10 weeks and are provided with housing. And they work with our faculty on different projects. So this is just an example of some of the projects from previous years. And you can see mine um, down at the bottom, which is the human impacts on marine mammal populations. Are there any questions before I go on into talking more about my research? It doesn't look like we have any questions just yet. Um, as a reminder too, if you're watching from Whova, you can also ask questions in the Q&A section. Okay, so I will continue, but feel free to put in some questions and I'll make sure we end with enough time. So my own research, which involves students, um, by the way, the University of Redlands has graduate programs, but not in the biology or environmental science areas. So that means that the students who work on this project are all undergraduates and they can start as early as the first year. And of course, many use this as part of their senior capstone research. So my particular emphasis is really pretty broad, but looking at all the different marine mammal species we have in the local areas and really trying to assess how all of the human impacts could be influencing their behavior and distribution. And we do this by working with actually a very local um, location. We work out of Dana Point. So I have a lot of experience in that area. And we collaborate with Dana Wharf um, Whale Watching. And they have been super supportive and provide opportunities for my students and myself to go out on their boats and to collect data. So what we do is we take surveys. We've done some programs where we charter a boat ourselves and follow set paths. So we can go up and down the coast along the continental shelf edge. We've also done surveys out of Catalina using a small boat. And then, of course, we work with the whale watch boats as well to collect more opportunistic data. We also do some shore surveys where we can watch the animals without ourselves being any potential disturbance. And we record all the animals we see. Um, we used to do this on paper and pencil. We've updated so that we now use a tablet to record all the data through an app. And then I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with ArcGIS, but it's a really useful program for looking at spatial trends. So we can basically create a map, and I'm just gonna show you an example of one, of where we see animals and when we see them. 
And this map is actually a time animation showing all of our sightings of blue whales. And started in 2012. And now as you see the little uh, flukes popping up, those are the blue whale sightings. If you look closely, you'll notice those times where we don't see any. And then they start to pop up in the spring and summer months. So blue whales come to the area to feed. And we've um, seen a big decline in more recent years. So in 2013, 14, 15, 16, they were pretty common in the summer months. And the numbers have started to drop off. We don't entirely know why that is. We have some hypotheses having to do with uh, sea surface temperature and shifts in where the prey are. But this is just an example of how we can visualize what's happening both in space and over time. And by the way, the, this area that you see here is the continental shelf edge, which is where the water goes from being shallow to very deep. It's very important for marine mammals because it's where you get upwelling, which brings up nutrients and therefore more food for the marine mammals. And what we're fortunate about is in data point, that shelf edge is so close to shore that we don't have to travel very far to see a huge diversity of marine mammals. One tool that we use quite a bit is photographic identification, which is what it sounds like. We just identify individual animals based on distinctive markings. This shows here some of the markings that we would use. So for dolphins, we usually use the dorsal fin. If any of you have been whale watching out of data point, you may have heard of patches. These uh, are very famous, iconic dolphin bottlenose that has um, a form of albinoism binoism called leucism, where he's got white spots all over his skin. And these are not scars, these are just his coloration. So very obvious, distinct animal. But even ones that are not as obvious, we can start identifying based on their dorsal fin. For humpbacks, we use the underside of their fluke or their tail. Uh, for blue whales, we use their skin modeling coloration along with the fin shape. And this provides a lot of insight into a species. For example, here is an image of one animal, one blue whale that we've seen over the years. And um, it's got a very distinctive dorsal fin, oh, sorry, a uh, fluke with the little notch in it. So he's referred to as kinko. We also can look at the coloration on the side. And what's nice in this case is we have images of both sides and the tail so that we can keep track of when we see um, kinko over time. And by keeping these catalogs um, for long term, we can start learning how long whales live. There have been some animals in um, other populations where the same animal has been seen for 40 plus years. We can see if they have calves and if so, how frequently. We can look at their social relationships. So photo ID really provides a lot of insight. I wanted to include this um, map which, and images, which was created by a student who's just finished her honors um, defense so she did this project for her capstone studying Rissos dolphins, which are um, seen in our local waters. And she used a program called Flukebook, which helps to automate the identification. It still requires people to confirm, but it uses um, the coloration patterns, which you can see in this image. So this spot here matches this spot here, and therefore, we know that's the same individual dolphin. And this is just a map showing where different pods were seen and then how many were in each pod. And she did a really neat analysis as well, looking at which animals were together in the pods when they were seen multiple times. And there are some that seem to be kind of in a buddy system where you find them um, together multiple times. And from this project, she was able to identify that we have somewhere between about 100, 100 to 150 individual dolphins. Um, and looking at the fact that they seem to prefer 
being in deeper waters, which is likely due to their feeding behavior because the species focuses on um, deep sea squid. Another project we've been working on is looking at disturbance of boats on sea lions. And we do this by actually surveying um, from the shore. So sea lions would come out and haul out on this little buoy. Here's a picture of the sea lions. And we watch from this upper cliff vantage point so that we are not introducing any disturbance ourselves. And we observe the behavior of the animals. And the reason we do this is because we see some really obnoxious activities out there sometimes. Um, this is a case when we were out in the field and we saw these guys zipping around in their jet skis. You can see in this picture, the guy has his hand out and what he does is he actually reaches out and tries to pet the sea lion. You can see here, he was upset because he missed. I feel like he should just be happy he still has his arm. That was a big male sea lion, you don't wanna to be touching them. Um, but even less obvious disturbances can still influence the behavior of the sea lions. And we have done um, years of study and have found that there is a shift that the sea lions spend less time at rest and become more active and alert when boats are nearby. And this of course can affect their energetics and their survival. So I wanna move on and talk about a few different students who've worked with me and what they're doing now, but I did wanna see if there are any questions about the research. Someone does have a question. Um, they're wondering how can they learn more about GIS and the system and how to use it? Okay, so the question was about the GIS. Yeah, GIS is great. It's such a neat program. Um, and one of the things we're really lucky about in Redlands is that uh, the main program that's used by the majority of the world is created by a company called Esri or ESRI, and they are based here in Redlands. So we have a lot of support and we have a center for spatial studies. We have a minor in spatial studies as an option, and I incorporate it into most of my classes. So it's something that when you go into college, I would definitely keep an eye out for classes and opportunities to learn about GIS. Um, you can also teach yourself to some degree, um, but it does help to have some coursework in the topic because it's, it's not that it's especially hard to use, but it can take some time just getting familiar with all the different tools and to really be able to take advantage of it. So a few students who have worked on this project, I just wanted to highlight briefly. Um, as some examples. So Laura did her um, degree at the University of Redlands, finished in 2011. She did a BS degree in biology, a minor in chemistry, and she took advantage of a lot of opportunities. So she took my May term travel class that went, um, did the hybrid class in California. She spent a semester abroad in Baja, Mexico, she did summer research with me, and at that time it was in British Columbia, Canada. And then she did a project for her senior capstone that was focused on using photographs to identify injuries in gray whales. And using that background, she went on and got her master's and her PhD at the University of Aberdeen in the UK. And she focused on looking at the distribution patterns of harbor porpoises. And now she is a senior analyst at a consulting firm in the UK. Um, it's been really cool because I've been, I go to conferences that are international and that's the one time I get to run into her again. And, you know, now she's the successful professional. Georgina Stone is another student. She finished in 2014. She did the Johnston program, which was the one where you can develop your own major. And she focused on marine environmental studies. She did summer research with me and her senior project. And she was really interested in how well the whale watching guidelines, um, how well they're used and if they're effective. She also did a semester abroad on sea, which is the program where you can sail aboard a ship for the semester and focus on marine ecology. 
And then she did an internship in Belize with a nonprofit. Since then, she spent five years working at an educational nonprofit, um, actually at Ocean Institute. So some of you might know Georgina. And then she was a naturalist and a deckhand for a local whale watch company. And currently she is working on getting her teaching credential. Adrian was another student. She did her BS in environmental policy and management with a minor in spatial studies. She took my matron travel class to the Galapagos um, and did summer and senior research where she actually used quite a bit of GIS to model the habitat use of blue and humpback whales. She um, and went on and did her master's degree at Oregon State University, focused on marine policy, where she studied um, marine protection areas and wanted to see basically how those are managed and how decisions are made. And she um, then went on and is currently doing a fellowship with NOAA in their coastal management and also works as the director, director of a coastal society and outreach chair. And finally, uh, Taylor D is um, another recent grad with a BS in biology and she did a minor in the human animal studies. She also did summer and senior research with me focused on behavior of common dolphins. And she now works as a field biologist for a consulting firm in Orange County, but she gets to, these uh, pictures are actually more recent photos of her because a lot of her job involves traveling to different areas to study all the different wildlife, including marine mammals, um, reptiles, birds, fish, and amphibians. So she gets to do a lot of field work and her experience working in my lab really helped her um, get that position. So notice that she does not have a graduate degree. So not all career paths require further education beyond the undergraduate. And of course, I have many other students. These are just a few that I wanted to highlight. So what I tried to do today is just kind of talk a little bit about different opportunities. And I really emphasize getting experience. Um, and the more experience you have, hopefully, the more excited you'll get about the field. And then you can also help others get excited and realize the importance of the oceans um, and how much value they play, they, how much value they provide, because we really need to recognize this and have the whole community backing up and supporting ocean conservation. And I like this quote from Dr. Sylvia Earle, very famous oceanographer, it says, we need to respect the oceans and take care of them as if our lives depended on it, because they do. So I would love to take questions. Great. Um, so our first question that we have are, um, is, sorry, going off, um, does your campus offer graduate level programs? So um, that is a good question. We do in other fields. So we have a master's in GIS. So for students who want to get more experience doing spatial work, that's um, a one year master's program. Then we also have the, um, we have the School of Ed. So if students want to go on to becoming, going into education, and we have the School of Business, which offers um, graduate degrees. But in the traditional biology and environmental science, we don't have graduate programs at this time. Awesome. All right. Another question that we got is, are there any opportunities, whether in person or virtual, for high school students looking for um, experiences to have with your um, universities? That is a great question. Um, I've had a few students sometimes come out in the field with me, just kind of try it out and see. And so if somebody's really interested in this topic, feel free to reach out to me, send me an email. Um, beyond that, it's a little challenging just because of um, you know, access and whatnot, unless they're local to Redlands, of course. But 
that would be one option. Another thing is we do have a summer school program and I will be teaching a marine science class this summer. It's actually online, so accessible for people from anywhere. And um, if you're in high school and wanna get a little feel for marine biology at the college level, this would be a great class. It's an introductory course. So you don't have to have any prerequisites. Awesome, great. Um, someone else is asking, what is it like to work in a college lab or do research at the college level? That's a great question. I think sometimes students feel intimidated before they start. Um, but the great thing is that we train the students, especially by working with undergrads. You know, there's a training process. So my project especially works well because you don't necessarily need any particular skills or techniques. You just need to learn how to record the data and what we're looking for. And that just takes a little bit of experience. Um, and then the GIS is something that, you know, we teach you how to do and you get more experience with it. And then sometimes students will develop their own projects that are totally different. For example, this semester, I have one student who wanted to study microplastics. I've never done anything with microplastics. So she's working with myself and a chemistry professor. And we um, actually just recently obtained samples from the Pacific Marine Mammal Center of animals who died. So we have blubber samples, liver samples, et cetera. And she's gonna basically go through those and try to find what microplastics are in the tissues. Another student wanted to do environmental DNA. Um, that's again, outside of my area. So we're working with a collaborator, but these are seniors who kind of started with the basics and then built up their skills. And we do a lot of, most of our coursework involves labs. So students build up their lab skills and things that sound really scary at first, they learn how to do. And we help them you know, with guidance and training. Awesome, yeah. So you mentioned earlier that you're going to be teaching a summer course for marine science. We have a lot of people interested in that and they're wondering, um, how they can find out more information and enroll for it. Okay, you know what? Um, I will see if I can find the link and put it in the chat. Would everybody be able to see that then? Um, if not, I can also post it um, on Hoova for you. Okay, I'll look for it while I take other questions. All right, <laughs> thank you. Um, somebody else is wondering, um, what's the deadline for summer in summer internships? So for the summer internships, those are for actual um, current students at the University of Redlands. So we don't have that one open outside of the university. Um, but it's, you know, when students are enrolled, typically they do it between their junior and their senior year, sometimes between sophomore and junior. Um, and they usually apply around, I think it's January, February. I just went through the applications and selected my students for the summer and I'm taking three this summer. I'm actually taking um, all three that applied and um, did a little bit of training to make sure that this is what they wanted to do. So um, that's a great option for students. Most of those kinds of programs, you do need to be in college already to do. I don't think there's very many of them accessible for, under, for high school students, but you don't have to do everything all this to start with. In high school, you can volunteer at places. Like I know the, um, the Pacific Marine Mammal Center has opportunities, and I think Ocean Institute has opportunities for getting some volunteer experience. Great. Um, another question that someone asked, is it, is it common for your students to minor in something or double major? <laughs> That's a good question. You might have noticed that on my list. It's actually really common. I don't know what it is exactly um, about our program, but I would say the majority of my students do a major and a minor um, or a double major, depending. We also offer two degrees in biology. There's a BS and a BA. The BS has more required courses. It's more science focused. Um, the BA obviously is still science, but it's easier to combine with another degree. So it gives you more um, breadth and they don't have to be related. Um, you know, obviously you can do biology and chemistry or biology and environmental science, but I've had students do, you know, biology and art. So 
it can really, um, the main thing that helps for doing more than one major is if you kind of come in knowing at least that you want to go into the biology or the environmental science end and get started on the classes in the beginning. Um, sometimes students switch later, which is fine too, but it's harder to combine with another one then. I did put the link to the summer school and the class that I'm doing is Biology 111. And I'll put that in the link as well. It's kind of obvious because it says Intro to Marine Biology. <laughs> Other questions? Awesome, great, sorry. I was adding that to the chat. Um, someone else is asking, what is your favorite thing about your program or your school? That's a good question. Um, I have a few. I'd say one of my favorite things about our curriculum and our program is the matrum. Um, I love being able to teach a single class and to be able to have students really get in-depth experience. Um, and like, for example, when we all had to go online and the travel course, of course, was canceled, I switched to, I taught marine, mam marine mammal ecology. Um, and that was actually turned out to be really fun because I, by being online, I had experts coming in from like Australia and Mexico and Canada. Um, and that ended up being a great class. Uh, the other things I really love, the focus on GIS, which is just such an important tool. And then in terms of the university, I find that we have really nice students. And that sounds like a strange thing to focus on, but in some of my experience previously, I found students were very competitive and focused just on the grade. Whereas I feel like my students at Redlands are more focused on learning and being, you know, they collaborate, they work together, they help one another. They're not trying to just, you know, get the last half a decimal point change in the grade. Um, so it's a really nice community to be at. And the campus is beautiful. <laughs> awesome, great, thank you. Um, we also have another question. Is there anything that they, um, I could do as a high school student that would make me a better candidate for your degree program? I think in high school, the most important thing is just, you know, try out different things to see where, where you like. You know, I think sometimes it's hard because, of course, you have kind of a prescribed curriculum. Um, but if you can, you know, take classes in different areas that you may or may not think you're interested in, you'll get to do a lot more of that, of course, in college. If you're able to get some hands-on experience, that's great. But a lot of students come in without any, and that's that's great too. There's there's no requirement that you've done marine mammal biology before you show up. <laughs> um, if you're really interested in marine biology and you have opportunities to snorkel or get scuba certified, you know and that's something that interests you, you should take it, but you don't have to do that. I've, thought, I've known many marine biologists who don't scuba dive, it's not a requirement. Um, and I think just, you know, the most important thing I look for for students is the passion. So like when I'm selecting summer students, if they're applying to work with me just because they want to get a paid position in the summer, that's not gonna be as, you know, useful, even if they have a super high GPA as somebody who's like, this is what I'm excited about, what I really want to do, or at least I want to have more experience in it, even if they want to go into a different field. Um, that's going to be much more important than the GPA or the particular experiences they've had in the past. Great, awesome. I think this is our last question. Um, can you describe a little bit what campus life is like? I know you're not in admissions, but... They're wondering, um, what is it like to live on campus as an undergrad student? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And like I said, uh, as not a student, I can only give perspective from what I've heard from students. Um, so uh, the majority of our students do live on campus. We do have commuters as well. Um, you know, people who are local to the Inland Empire, but I think it's still more of a residential campus. It's a small university. We have about, I think at max 2,500 undergraduates. So 
our courses are small. We typically have, you know, like the class I'm teaching right now is 20 students. Um, we, the, there's a pretty active, you know, like just there's a, a lot of students are in fraternities and sororities. Many of those are like service oriented um, or there's a science one. So that plays, I think, a role in some of the social life. You know, sports are big, but it's, we're, I think it's D3. So it's not, you know, we're not at the UCLA competitive level, but a lot of our students do participate in sports. And actually our scholar athletes tend to be some of our best students, I think, because they've had to learn how to balance a lot of different things. Uh, there's a lot of clubs and activities. We have a big outdoor programs, um, which I really think is cool. So students can go camping for the weekend or go to a Catalina Island and kayak. And, you know, they, they're run by students. So students can kind of start getting experience in it and then they can become trip leaders. There's the, um, let's see, the study abroad that we mentioned, a lot of students, I think we have about 50% of students study abroad, um, at least for a semester. I'm sorry, at least for May term, but also for a semester. And we do have a, um, like our own program, which is in Salzburg, Austria. So in that case, students go as a unit from the university. It's all Redland students who travel and spend the semester in Europe and then they travel to other places as well. And um, I think, yeah, so it's, we're located, for people who don't know where Redlands is, because <laughs> many people have never heard of us, um, we are really nicely located in terms of access to a lot of things. So we're about, it takes about an hour, 10 minutes to get to Data Point, um, hour to two hours to LA, depending on traffic, um, about 45 minutes to Big Bear. Uh, hour to Joshua Tree, you know, Palm Springs, that kind of area. Um, so nice location in terms of getting to a lot of different habitats. So we can do a lot of field trips. And the one super exciting thing is the train. <laughs> Not everyone's excited, but I am. Um, the Metrolink is now ends on our campus. They're doing testing right now. So it should be up and running within a few months, which means that getting to places like LA is a lot easier without having, don't have to have a car. Nice, well, thank you so much. I think that's it for questions that we have. So again, thank you so much, Dr. Stell, for your time and for presenting about the University of Redland and all of our attendees today. Um, and we wish you all the best luck in your next um, pathways. Thank you everyone for coming and feel free to email me if you have any questions. Um, I'll put my email here in the chat. It's probably on my awesome. phone. And then well. I'll also copy and paste that email on it over to the chat that's in Hoover as well. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you again. Great rest of your day.